إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, today's hadith is, as always, a very great hadith. This hadith, like the previous hadith, touches on the character of the believer, the things that help uh, societies, communities uh, to function. <clears throat> as well as talking about the very essential parts of the faith, uh, Iman itself. So, let us first read the hadith and then uh, explain it. The hadith is, goes, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليقل خيرا أو ليصمت ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم جاره ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم ضيفه رواه البخاري ومسلم So this hadith the translation is on the authority of Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه the companion of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم عن رسول الله from the Prophet from the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him قال he said whoever believes in Allah and the last day let him speak good or or remain silent and whoever believes in Allah and the last day then let him treat in a very noble manner his neighbor. And whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him treat in a very noble manner his guest. That's the basic translation of this hadith. Uh, for those of you that have followed uh, very closely in the progression of the hadith, you might have noticed that we have uh, jumped a few hadith uh, in the series uh, and the hadiths that we have jumped inshallah if Allah gives us time uh, we will come back to them but as for today we will explain this hadith so the Prophet وسلم, he is speaking about Iman the very essence of Islam okay, he's saying Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. Now, belief in Allah is a very big topic. And it is a very important topic. It is the topic, the one thing that all the prophets and messengers in the past always emphasized on. If you read the Quran, you will come across each and every prophet saying قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is no God for you other than Him. So this message of Tawheed is very important for us to understand. Right now, the one thing that I want uh, brothers and sisters to understand is uh, the kalima itself saying لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ some of us, we understand the implied meaning. For others, it might not be as clear. La ilaha illallah, basically, it's made up of two points, two pillars, ruknan. And this is important to understand. The first point is negating, meaning that you deny worship to everyone and everything. La ilaha. Ilah in Arabic, God, it literally means ma'luh ma'bud, something that is worshipped. 
It's not just uh, a God in the way that people think of a God in the sky, no. Ilah is anything that people take. Okay? This is why Allah when He speaks about people's gods, uh, Allah says, Aliha. Okay? Because some people have more than one Ilah. Some people have taken their own desires, their nafs, as Aliha, as gods, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say La ilaha, the first part, illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means that you negate all forms of worship. You don't worship uh, money. People worship money. You might think, how is it possible that a person worships money? Do they make sujood? Do they uh, pray to money? No. But the part of worship is doing anything. For some people, it's only a matter of how much. If you give them enough, then the halal becomes haram and the haram becomes halal. If you give them, if you tell them, kill that person, kill that person, take that person's life. People might say, okay, I think there's a problem with the, with the sound. I hope the, the sisters can hear a bit better. <clears throat> so we're talking about people taking aliha, gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people we said worship money. And this is a reality. If you tell them go and kill so and so, killing is haram. But if you give the right price, if you tell them I'll give you a thousand dollars, they will say no, it's haram. Ten thousand? Exactly. 10,000, no, it's haram. A million, if you make it two million, I'll do it, okay? This is the way that people worship money. Just one of the ways. Other people, they have, they worship other human beings. How many people today worship Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. How many people worship their leaders? Some even worship their religious leaders, right? Of other faiths, they believe that they have the right to make halal haram and haram halal. So this is a type of worship. So when you say la ilaha, you negate all that. You push that to the side. And then you come with the important part. Both of them are important, but this is affirming. So you affirm the worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, illallah. And if you don't come with both parts, then there's a problem with your Islam. You can't say, I'm a Muslim, but I worship this person, or I worship this thing. The people in the past, Abu Jahl and the Mushrikeen, when the Prophet وسلم, would tell them, La ilaha illallah, they would refuse because they knew that La ilaha illallah means you have to leave off Lat and Uzza and Manat and Hubal and all these idols. When it said to them, La ilaha illallah, they show pride and they say are we going to leave off our idols just because a mad poet says so so they understood what la ilaha illallah means so as muslims it's very important for us to understand the true concept and the important link to make here is ibadah that it means la ilaha illallah la ma'buda bihaqqin illallah 
and it does not mean la mawjuda illallah like some people have said that there is no uh, presence other than Allah or nothing exists except Allah but the important thing is ibadah why is it important because each and every prophet would always emphasize on that uh, worship even when you ask the mushrikeen of Mecca they knew that Allah Azza wa Jal existed if you ask them, if you ask Abu Jahl, who created the heavens and the earth, he will say, Allah. All of them will say, without a doubt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. But, how wrong are they? They say Allah Azza wa created everything, but at the same time, they worship other than Allah. So this is the point that we need to understand both as in terms of knowledge as well as implementing it in our actions and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went on and he said and to believe in the last day okay this is important why because believing in the last day it is both in theory that you understand that when people die they will come back Allah Azza wa Jal will bring them back Allah Azza wa Jal uses this as a, uh, a point against the disbelievers that the disbelievers they don't believe that there will be an afterlife that Allah Azza wa Jal will bring the dead back And they say, when I die, will I be brought back to life again? And Allah Azza wa Jal tells them, Is Allah Azza wa Jal not the one that created you before Lam before you were something? You were nothing before you were born. So this emphasis on the last day, it's a part of Iman. But also, it shows that there's actions connected to it. Remember before, when we spoke about Iman in general, and we said that Iman is a statement on the tongue, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But also, it involves actions. And it's a conviction in the heart. When Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the change of the Qibla, and we've mentioned this before in Surah Baqarah. You know how the Qibla used to be in Bayt al-Maqdis before? And then it got changed to uh, the Kaaba, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. Allah Azza wa Jal says that Allah Azza wa Jal لَنْ يُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ That Allah Azza wa Jal will not make your Iman in vain. The scholars in Islam, they say it means the Salah. So, you see throughout, both in the Quran and in the Sunnah, there's always a connection. Iman is not just something that is said. Iman is not just something that is in the heart. But there's action. What's the proof for that in this hadith? The Prophet ﷺ is himself telling you, if you believe in Allah and the last day, in other words, prepare for it. How do you prepare for it? فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ Let the person speak good or remain silent. Imagine someone is about to meet the king tomorrow. Right? If you are about to meet the king or the president tomorrow, at seven o'clock in the morning what do you do now you prepare for it right you don't sit here you might be out buying new clothes you might uh, prepare yourself take a shower make sure you go to sleep early so you don't miss it so here the prophet وسلم, is telling us that if you believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, if you believe in that last day, 
then these are the things that you should be coming with. And if you don't come with these things, then there's a problem. Inshallah, you're still a Muslim. No one has taken you outside the fold of Islam. But in order for you to be the Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging you to become, then you need to implement these things. So what's the first thing? Speech. Speak good or remain silent. It sounds simple, but it is one of the things that will lead to a lot of people's destruction. The scholars in Islam, they used to say speech itself is neither good or evil. And silence itself is neither good or evil. It all depends. Sometimes silence can be bad. And sometimes speech can be good and sometimes the opposite. Let's say someone does something wrong and you need to speak up. If you remain silent in that situation, then you've committed a sin. You should have spoken up. And the opposite is true. Not all speech is good. And the scholars in Islam even said, if you speak too much, there's more risk that you will say something that is wrong. This is why the scholars in Islam, they had this question. Some people asked one of the uh, imma, one of the imams, which one is better, speaking or silence? I'll ask you guys, which one do you think is better? And give your reasoning. Yes. That's a good point. But let me make it a little bit more difficult. What if you have to choose? Stay silent. Stay silent. Why? That's a very good point. The brother is saying, which one is best, speaking or silence? Silence. Why? Because you've saved yourself. You haven't said anything wrong and you haven't said anything good. You're at zero. Does anyone agree, disagree? Any other opinions? Yes. Yes. Uh, David says that so to ask them, uh, so like keep silent is better than talking because when you're talking you make mistakes and uh, then you collect sense yes. so it's better to keep silent. Jazakallah khair and the brother agrees and he added a hadith to support that claim. Jazakallah khair. Does anyone disagree? Or yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Jazakallah khairan. Yes. Jazakallah khairan. That's a very good point. The brother said, one of the things that he said is, Silence is better because once you say something, you can't take it back. Does anyone think that speaking is better than silence? Yes. Any reason behind it? Jazakallah khairan. 
The brother is mentioning a hadith where the Prophet said, whoever sees evil, then let them change it with their hand and so on. And one of the things that the Prophet said, let him change it with his tongue, the lisani, that he speaks up against it. So based on that, the brother is saying, the uh, speaking is better. Now this topic, yes, you have an opinion? Actually, I'm thinking of where, like, there might be war in other countries. If you just like look at them, that's actually wrong. But just look at them, just do nothing. I don't want, like, I don't want to get into war. Yes. Like the right thing maybe is to just donate. Donate, actually do something. Yes. So which one of these two would you choose, speaking or silence? Speaking. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now this uh, topic. Scholars, they have difference of opinion. So it's not something that is necessarily wahi, that you say this person is wrong and this person is right. However, when this Imam, this particular Sheikh scholar was asked, he put it in a very beautiful way. He said, speaking generally is better than silence. Why? What was his reasoning? He said, the benefit of silence is just confined to the person. If you remain silent, you've saved your own self. Right? You haven't made any mistakes, you haven't said anything wrong. That benefit is for you. But let's say you speak up. And we assume that you speak up for good. Because if you speak up falsely and wrongly, there's no doubt, it's always wrong. But let's say you speak up for good. Then that speaking up, who benefits? More than the person themselves, right? So because of that, in the same way, if a person wants to ask you, praying, which one is better? Praying a hundred raka'ah, or teaching knowledge, teaching Quran. One, both of them are good. The one that prays a hundred rak'ah, that benefit belongs to themselves. But the one that teaches Quran, not only did he benefit himself, but he benefited other people as well. So that's one of the reasons that some of the scholars use in this particular, uh, for this particular question. So. This is a topic that scholars have written many, many books on. Speech itself. If a person is not careful, they can ruin in one hour worship that they've done for a very long time. The scholar says specifically about the Eid after Ramadan. People, they fall into a lot of sin. And a majority of the sin might be through their mouths. They speak falsehood. They gossip. They fall into uh, griba and so on. And the scholars remind people, be careful. Don't let 30 days or 29 days of Ramadan go to waste. And similarly, speaking good can bring a lot of benefit. If you help people, if you teach them what is good, not just in religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even said in the Quran that if you're not able to give someone charity, then at least give them a good word. Because sometimes a good word has more of an impact than money. So if you don't have money, Instead of making the, first, the person feel bad, give them hope. Maybe I can't give you now, but inshallah, maybe in the future I'll have uh, the ability. So this topic is very big, but in order to move on with the hadith, we will keep it short. <clears throat> One final point that I want to mention on this part of the hadith his speech itself is a very beautiful statement by Ali radiallahu anhu, I believe it was. He said, 
Iyaka, Iyaka, Tumma, Iyaka. He said, be careful. Be very, very careful of using the sharpness of your tongue against the one who taught you speech. In a bigger sense, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Allah Azza wa teaches. But in a worldly sense, who is it that teaches us how to speak? Yeah. Parents, specifically in particular, who? Mother. The mother, right? Yeah. One of the first words that children say is mama, or whatever other language, but it's usually mother or mom. So this great companion of the Prophet وسلم, is telling us and how often do we see that happening? We forget that our mothers were the ones that taught us. And yet you see children when they speak to their mothers, especially during the teenage phase, sometimes even older than that, they say, oof, they say, I hate you. I hope you die. And this is against the person who brought you up. Against the person who taught you the words that you're using. So that is a beautiful reminder from that great scholar, uh, from that great companion, Ali radiallahu anhu. And then the Prophet sallallahu continued. So we know speech, good speech, is from Iman. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَةً The one who believes in Allah in the last day, let him treat in a noble manner, way, his neighbor. The scholars in Islam, when it comes to defining the neighbor, and we mentioned this before, the most literal way is obviously the people that live close to you. The house on your right, on your left, in front, behind you, and so on. Those are your neighbors. But some scholars have gone even beyond that. They've said, your whole hay, your whole, uh, the area around you is or are your community, your neighbors. Some scholars say 40 doors down the road and up the road to your left, to your right, are your neighbors. And why did the Prophet ﷺ mention being good to your neighbors after mentioning good speech? The scholars in Islam, they say, treating in a good way, the very least, is good speech, right? It doesn't cost you anything to say to your neighbor, good morning, good evening. Even less than that, if you can't even say a good word, do not cause him harm. How many neighbors hate each other? The children are too loud, they scream, they shout. Some people play music very loud. Some shout and scream. Even if, as a Muslim, you play Quran with a high volume, loud in your house, and it caused your neighbor harm, then that is wrong. It doesn't matter whether it's good speech, if it's the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point is, you cause them difficulty. So this topic of neighbors, the Prophet sallallahu kept emphasizing it again and again. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu himself said that Jibreel alayhi salam kept mentioning the rights of the neighbor to such an extent that the Prophet ﷺ thought that the neighbor would 
take some of the inheritance, the ilm. So this is to the level, and this is something that we as Muslims, we fall short. Maybe back home in Muslim countries, you see a bit more hospitality. You see people a little bit more neighborly. Generally speaking, there's always many exceptions. But I believe this is even more important in a place like this, where people keep to themselves. It's no surprise that this society and many others in the western part of the world, people keep to themselves. They don't maybe have the same ties with their families. They don't have the same ties with their neighbors. But then it is up to us, it's our responsibility that we find out who our neighbors are. To when we have some occasion to be happy, we pass on that happiness. Our children finish a juz in the Quran. We might make some food, have a small celebration to encourage the children. Pass that on to the neighbor. You don't have to go into detail and say, my child finished this chapter and so on. But say, we have a celebration, we wanted you to take part in it. It will have a big impact. And notice how the Prophet ﷺ said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. This is Iman. And the scholars in Islam in the past, they used to say, it is not Hajj, it is not Siyam, that make people reach the levels that they reach. Rather, it is these type of things. It's the interaction. It's the akhlaq. <clears throat> And then the Prophet وسلم, added the last part. And whoever believes in Allah in the last day, then let him treat in a noble manner his guest. Notice the word that the Prophet وسلم, uses. Ikram. Ikram is, it goes beyond the bare minimum. If you treat someone good and you show karam, then it's beyond that. Instead of offering the person a cup of water, you try to find the best drink that you have. Instead of offering the person to sleep as a guest on your floor, you try to find a mattress for the person. You go above and beyond. And this is the word that the Prophet ﷺ is using. When it comes to the guest, this shows how beautiful Islam is. Every single person has a right in Islam. Not just people, animals have rights. This is 1,400 years ago. The Prophet وسلم, when he's talking about slaughtering an animal, he gives rules. This is how it's done properly. When some of the companions would see an animal, a camel, being overburdened, they would instruct them, tell people, remove the items from the animal, it's too much. Even plants and things around us have these rights. 
and we as we as Muslims were instructed وَآتِ كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقًّا that you have to give every single thing its due right even your own nafs, your soul you have to give it its right your wife give her her right or the wives give your husband their rights your children and most importantly give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his right so We've spoken about the neighbor. And now the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us about the visitor. What right does the visitor have? Islamically, if in a general sense, if there's no reason for you to have any doubts that this person is dangerous or might cause you harm, the asal the foundation is that the visitor has a right, even if he is a complete stranger to you. If the person comes to you, knocking on your door, then Islamically, the person has a right to stay a day and a night. That's what the scholars have said. One day and one night. Three days and three nights is mustahab. It's more liked. And more than that, it is sadaqa. And this is obviously taking in consideration people's means. Not everyone has the means to host a guest. But it shows us to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ would focus on the community. How often do we as Muslims not hear about someone in the community that needs a place to stay? Just the other day, without mentioning any names, there was a particular individual who had to stay in a shelter. Not for a week, not for two weeks, but for four months. Four months. Muslim. And this reflects bad on the community. And I'm not saying that you have to open up your doors and you take responsibility and you take responsibility. But at the very least, there should be some awareness. And perhaps we might reach that level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up our hearts and we become closer to the companions of the Prophet So, guests in Islam, they have rights. Some scholars have even said, even if the person is a, a non-Muslim, this generosity should be extended. And if it's extended, it is a means of da'wah. One thing that a lot of people mention, just yesterday we had a class that came to visit the masjid. 120 students, 120 students. I believe it might be the biggest that we've had in a very long while. But one thing that every visitor that comes to the masjid that they mention is they always mention the hospitality of Muslims and it's not just the masjid people who travel to other parts of the world those who have traveled to Saudi 
They speak about the hospitality. Those who have traveled to other Muslim countries, Egypt, they speak about the hospitality, how friendly people are, how they meet you with a smile. Even if they have a little bit of food, they will tell you, come and eat with me. And you don't distinction, make the distinction, are you a Muslim or not? No, they say, come, have some dates, have some bread. Why? Because it comes from this hadith and many other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what our religion teaches us. This is what a true Muslim should be. And I've said it many times before and I'll say it again. If we implemented the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the way that is supposed to be implemented, people would flock around the masjid. He would say, who are these people? What is this secret that makes them so generous? When I was in one, in a radio show a while ago, here in Victoria, there was a caller that called in. And they said, Imam, you speak very well, but They said, you speak very well, but Islam is an outdated religion. This is their speech. Islam is an outdated religion. It needs to be modernized. It needs to be changed to be brought into the 21st century. And the person went on and on. When it was my turn to respond, I thank the man for his input, but I mentioned the same thing that I'm mentioning to you. It's not that Islam is outdated. It's not that Islam needs to be modernized. The problem is ourselves, that we do not implement Islam the way it's supposed to be implemented. If we implemented Islam in the same way that the Prophet ﷺ did, you wouldn't see this nonsense that happens. These people who clearly go against the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, putting everyone at risk, that's not the Muslim way. So in short, and to conclude, this hadith teaches us the fundamental aspects of the religion, and I hope that you understand the link that these things that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about are not just nice things, are not just extra things on the side, treat your neighbor in a nice way and it makes you a great person or treat your guest in a good way and it makes you an amazing person. No, these are the fundamental things. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, this is how they should act. They should speak good. The Prophet ﷺ was not uh, a vile speaker, meaning his speech was never foul. He never swore. He never used bad words. Today you see all Muslim men and women, when they get upset, they use bad language. Everyone makes mistakes. In the heat of the moment, it's difficult to pull yourself back. But it doesn't mean that it should be accepted. So, inshallah, with that, we will conclude uh, today's class. Uh, if anyone has any questions concerning this hadith, uh, now is the time to ask.